It is a great pleasure to welcome Killian Rochelle. Killian received his PhD in 2010 at the Université Pierre et Marie Curie, Paris 6, under the direction of Irina Korkova. He is currently a CNRS researcher affiliated with the Institut Denis Platon, Université de Tours, and University of Dorléans. <laughs> and he will be moving to Angers next year. <laughs> Uh, his research interests span over a wide variety of topics in probability and combinatorics, including random processes and cones, dimer models and statistical mechanics, and stochastic models for population dynamics. He was awarded an ERC starting grant in elliptic combinatorics, which has resulted in over 25 publications in just the last three years. Let us please welcome Kilian, who will speak today about reflective Brownian motion in a wedge from probability theory to Galois theory of difference equations. Welcome, Kilian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. So thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Ellen, for this invitation. It's a big pleasure to be to be here. So <clears throat> I will I will speak mainly about some probabilistic objects, so reflected Brownian motion in, in some cones, and I will try to relate this to some other topic, let's say in in, in pure mathematics, um, related to Q difference equations. Um, so on the left, you can see a picture. Uh, ex explaining just uh, one Brownian path. So we take a Brownian motion in some cone. And uh, as I'm going to define a bit later, uh, we need to, to use a few parameters to define this process. So I think it will be five or six parameters. And uh, the aim of my talk is to explain finally for which of these parameters we are going to have uh, simplifications of uh, some formulas. So these parameters, I, I will call them exceptional parameters because uh, yeah, they, they will be quite uh, rare. And uh, on the right, so a priori it's unrelated, uh, I have just uh, represented one Q difference equation. So for me, a Q difference equation will be uh, to find some function f, uh, which satisfies an equation of the form f of qs is equal to a of s times f plus uh, b of s. So Q is a parameter, it's known. Uh, a and B are known functions, and the, the goal is to find uh, F. Um, just to give one example, I have uh, put this uh, theta function, uh, which is defined in terms of Q and S. So let's say there are two variables. And if you compute, um, it's easy to prove that they, they do satisfy a, a Q difference equation of the form uh, theta of Q S is equal to Q times S times uh, theta of S. Okay, so this was just to, to give one a possible example of such a Q difference equation. But of course, we have much more functions which do satisfy uh, similar equations. For example, some uh, Q hypergeometric series and, and so on. And also in this world, so in the, in the probabilistic world, we had the exceptional parameters. And also in this Q difference equations world, we do have uh, some nice theorems. And I wanted to mention this one by uh, Ishizaki, so it's dated uh, uh, 98. And it says that if we have a solution to such a Q difference equation, uh, we have a dichotomy, I mean, for the behavior of the function. So either the function will be quite simple and uh, the function will be uh, rational. So F, if you take a solution of, to some Q difference equation, it has to be uh, a rational function. Or if not, and so for me, let's say the function is irrational, I will call it an exceptional function. So it's exactly the parallel between the two worlds. And if not, it will be a hyper transcendental. So I'm going to define this uh, later, but let's say it will be a, a quite a complicated function. So in particular, it's not possible for a, a, a rather simple function like algebraic functions or solutions to, to some uh, differential equations. So there is a kind of gap between very simple functions or highly complicated functions. And it's a bit uh, what will be happening uh, for my probabilistic uh, object. And uh, the way to, to relate these two topics will be done uh, through some uh, Laplace uh, transform. But don't worry, I'm going to define uh, everything uh, in a minute. OK. So because I guess that's uh, not anybody is a probabilist uh, uh, in the audience, I wanted to, to briefly describe what is a Brownian motion. And um, so contrary to my example where I'm working in dimension two, 
uh, in this uh, section one, I'm working in dimension one. So it's very usual to introduce a Brunian motion by using discrete uh, objects, and in fact, discrete uh, random walks. So on the left, you can see uh, a very basic object in probability uh, theory. So it's a simple random walk in, uh, in dimension one. So let's say we're at time uh, zero. So I am here. And at time zero, I can jump. So either to the top with probability one half, or you go down uh, like this with probability one half. And then you just iterate the process. So you see uh, here, I have also taken a, an up jump and then down, down, and, and so on. So we have uh, what we call a random walk of a certain length. And um, oh, sorry. And now we, we try to do the same, but for a longer time. And uh, so it, it, it's exactly what I did uh, on the right picture. So I just took a longer time, and then I have represented one possibility for a trajectory of my uh, random walk. And uh, what happens, in fact, in the theory of uh, Brunian motion, is that if you do a, a correct scaling of, uh, of this picture, uh, namely, if we take here time equal to n, and uh, in the space, um, if, we, if we say that it, it, it needs to be equal to square root of n, then at the end, we are going to have something uh, non-degenerate. So a priori, it's uh, not clear. I mean, we could have just done something trivial and have uh, like just a, a line. But no, if we do this, we have some interesting object uh, at the limits. And I can do a simple picture of what is happening. So of course, it's uh, hard to, to draw a Brunian motion. But let's say it will look, it's very irregular, of course. And it makes something like this, OK? So it's a, it will be a continuous process with probability one. And uh, if you look at the regularity of the trajectories, in fact, there will be a nowhere uh, differentiable. So it's a highly irregular uh, uh, process. And uh, also, so it's a word uh, which I have written here. So universal, because a priori, if we take another random walk at the beginning, so not the simple walk, one half, one half, but another kind of random walk, um, if it has a zero mean, then in fact, we are going to have the same convergence. I mean, a convergence to the same uh, probabilistic uh, object as uh, this Brownian motion. So it appears to be a kind of universal uh, limit uh, of discrete uh, random walks. And uh, so even if I didn't uh, mention this now, so I said at the very beginning that we will be looking at reflected uh, Brunian motion. And so we need somehow to, to understand how to, to reflect, how to confine my process to, to stay in some region. So let's say that we, we want to define, now I, I just forbid to the process to go here. So I mean, to the negative regions, I don't want the process to go here. It will be a way to define a reflected uh, Brunian motion in R plus. So by this, I'm, I mean that imagine we, so we have a process. And if it, it hits uh, this line, we, we just want to, to reflect it and, and so that the process stays positive. And so we're going to have a picture like this with small excursions and so on. And uh, so because I don't want to, to give too many details today, let's say that we, we can do this uh, just with the absolute value. So here, if we, have, if we had a, a Brunian motion Bt, then we can define here just the absolute value of Bt. And it is just one way, a bit naive, but, but still it works, uh, to define a, a reflected Brunian motion. OK, so it's, it's exactly how I will confine my process to some domain. Okay, so now uh, I can go to the dimension two uh, setting. And so I have drawn some, some example again. So you can see on the left, uh, now I, I, I wanted to introduce a bit my parameters. Uh, you can see, uh, so we have a cone in dimension two, uh, we don't have much choice. A cone, it's uh, a wedge. So there is just one uh, angle, a beta. And then what is important is to have also two reflections uh, on the boundary axis. And uh, I will call them uh, epsilon and, and delta. So if you do uh, like a zoom 
uh, on my process. So it means that if I take a similar picture as before, so imagine we, uh, the process hits uh, the origin. If we have some uh, angles of reflection in this direction, then it means that the process will go exactly in this direction, at least uh, locally, okay? So it's a way to define, it will not be exactly the absolute value, it's a kind of oblique uh, uh, absolute value. So anyway, so, so we have this way of defining the process, a beta, two reflection angles, and also we have some, some drift. Uh, so by drift, I mean, this is something which is purely deterministic. So the Brunian motion is uh, random, and it's possible to, to add some deterministic parts, which is called uh, a drift. And um, yeah, so it's a drift for the process to go in the same direction uh, so on my picture, it's um, in the direction of the vertex of the, of the cone. So what I didn't say is that a priori, if you want to define a Boolean motion in dimension two, you just have to take uh, two uh, independent copies of the same uh, one dimensional Boolean motion. So it's a simple way to pass from the dimension one uh, to higher dimension. So there is no difficulty here. And uh, it will be uh, what happens uh, in this picture. So I have just two one dimensional Brunel motion. I have two coordinates. And the only difficulty is that uh, the process is reflected uh, at the axis. But now for me, it will be sometimes uh, more convenient to look at the same process in the quarter plane. And so for this, uh, we can do some uh, linear transformation of the cone. I mean, just a, a basic transformation. And then we just transform this uh, beta uh, cone into a quarter plane. And uh, doing so for sure, we're going to modify a bit all parameters, so reflections, also the drift. And also a difference is that we're going to have some correlation uh, now between the coordinates. So at the beginning, we had two, say, independent uh, processes, point and motion, and now we have a correlation uh, between the coordinates. Yeah, so. All along my talk, I'm going to jump a bit between the two settings because yeah, according to what I'm, I want to say. And now I wanted to do a, a short review of, um, so why uh, this process is, is interesting and uh, give a bit of a history uh, about it. So if you look at the literature, uh, the first motivation to introduce this process, it was done by uh, so famous probabilists like Varadhan, uh, Ruth Williams, Mike Harrison, so some people, mainly in the US at the time, and it was in the, in the 80s. So we can see some papers in the 85. And the motivation is, is as follows. So we take um, some discrete population, let's say, a, in fact, it's related to queuing systems. So I take two queues, say it's queue number one, and here it's queue number two. And we have a random evolution, so it's a random model, um, which for some reason, I mean, of course, we have many choices. It could be as follows. So let's say we had some time, and at this time we have uh, I people in this queue number one, and we have J uh, customers in this uh, queue number two. And uh, let's say at time n plus one, um, it's possible that there is some uh, more customer in the queue, in the first queue. And in this case, my, my process will move to the right. And for similar reasons, uh, we can have one more people in this queue and so on. So it's possible to describe the evolution of some two dimensional queue just by looking at some model, uh, which is naturally associated to, to the problem. And uh, so in these papers, uh, they had some toy models of this form. So a simple random walk in dimension two with just uh, four possible jumps. And, um, so this is an example of reflected uh, random walk. So why reflected? Because we're working with uh, individuals, so with people, and so it's not possible to have a negative number of people. So for sure, we're going to stay in this uh, quarter plane. And it's how they define this, this process. Um, and their questions uh, were the following. So they took i and j to be uh, very big. So i goes to infinity, j goes to infinity. And they were close to a regime uh, which is critical. So let's say at the limit, they have one half, one half 
uh, sorry, one fourth. So I want to have probabilities. So I want to sum up to one. And the question is finally, do we see something? Do we see some probabilistic object at the limits? And it's exactly what was uh, happening here. Uh, they introduced this reflected Brownian motion as a limit uh, for this queuing system. So it was very natural. And of course, it, the, the goal, and I think you, you all know this, that in probability, it's um, often easier to look at uh, continuous processes. And then we can use uh, some information on these continuous processes to approximate uh, many quantities uh, for the discrete model. So it's a way to, a usual way to do in probability theory. Yeah, so this was the motivation uh, in the, say, uh, the historical motivation. Something which is a bit more modern um, is related to population biology. You, you can imagine that finally my, my example, which was a bit simple, I, I admit, you can do it exactly in the same way if we, if we replace uh, Q1 and Q2 by any kind of uh, two-type population. So if you have two phenotypes in some population or genotypes, we can just uh, model the evolution of some two-dimensional population by exactly the same uh, mean. And so everything which we know about queuing system, we can transfer this to uh, many models from uh, biology. So this is a second motivation. A third one is related to some uh, finance models. So again, um, there are some concrete models, you, you can check this in the literature, uh, which use uh, two-dimensional random walks. So because we, we know a lot of things on these models and also uh, the limits of reflected Brownian uh, motion. And uh, yes, yeah, so there, there is one called the, uh, the study of some other book uh, market. And there are some computations, I mean, concrete computations uh, uh, done uh, using this kind of product. So the three uh, motivations were, uh, let's say, from apply the probability. But I would say that there are also some motivations um, in pure probability related to stochastic calculus. So if you do exactly uh, uh, the same model in higher dimension, so let's say dimension three, four, uh, in fact, almost nothing is known about this model. So if now we take a cone, I think I will not be able to draw it, but if you take a cone in dimension three, uh, for example, a Norton's, uh, sorry, let me erase a few things. So there are many, many open questions on this kind of uh, models. So even if we take uh, a simple cone uh, like uh, R plus three, we, we, we can uh, put some reflections, define some reflections on the, uh, the faces. And um, typically we, we know nothing about this kind of process. So there are many interesting questions of stochastic uh, calculus uh, related to these models. And the last motivation, um, a bit more related to discrete uh, processes, uh, is related, of course, to combinatorics. So there are many objects of combinatorics uh, for which we can find some uh, bijections uh, between them and uh, discrete random walks or discrete walks. And so using these bijections, uh, we can transfer some results uh, to, from the lattice walks uh, to the, the object uh, we had at the beginning. So again, we have many questions which are natural in this setting because we, we just want to study uh, many models in combinatorics. So it can be, I don't know, permutations or young tableau uh, maps. So, yeah. Okay, so it was a slide for doing a bit of advertisement. And now I, I would like to, to move a bit uh, uh, further in my study of the process. And um, even if the, the process might look a bit complicated or difficult to study, finally, one single parameter, uh, alpha, will allow us to, to, to say a lot of things. So now I would like to speak a bit about this parameter alpha. Uh, so by definition, we just take uh, the two reflections uh, on the axis, epsilon and delta, we do the sum, we subtract by, by pi, and we divide by, by the opening of the code. So we have a real number, uh, which may take any value between minus infinity and plus infinity. So it's uh, very geometric, in fact. Uh, let me do just uh, one picture, or maybe two. Um, 
Yeah, for example, let, let me speak a bit about this case, uh, alpha equal to one. So what is happening for this value of alpha? If you do a picture, um, we're exactly in this situation, in fact, of a triangle. Oh, sorry. I mean, if I have epsilon here, delta here, and, and beta, uh, you can check that alpha in this situation is equal to one, right? It's a, a very simple situation. So we, we somehow feel that this case will be a bit special because it's, uh, yeah, it may be interpreted as a, a kind of, I don't know, a dual point, I mean, auto-dual point for, for, some, for some duality. So we can speak a bit later about this. And another case, which is very famous in, in the literature was alpha equal to zero. So in this case, we have a picture like this. Um, so now it means that we have epsilon and we have uh, a delta. So delta and epsilon are complementary angles. And again, it's, um, so we are going to see that it's a very particular case. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we could speak uh, about other cases, but I would say uh, these two ones are the most um, interesting and at least particular ones. And so, so let's say we can say something from very specific values. And now I wanted to say a few more things about what is happening um, when alpha is big, for example. Uh, so now we take alpha bigger than two. So we are here. And um, if I try to do a picture, what happens is that, so alpha is big, it means that the two reflections, the two, the two angles are big. So we are in this situation where uh, the two angles are uh, like this. And so if you imagine a bit the particle, what will be happening is that every time it, it will hit uh, one of the two axes, it will be pushed in the direction of the, of the vertex, right, of zero. And so we're going to hit uh, zero, I mean the vertex, and in fact, we stay here. So it will not be possible for the process to exit uh, the vertex uh, once uh, it, it hits it, okay. So it's something we can prove. And so for me, uh, uh, this regime of parameters will not be interesting because uh, somehow the behavior is generates and I will be uh, focusing in uh, all the other values of alpha. And uh, so, so we can continue a bit and say that for alpha between zero and two, now it's a bit better with probability one, we will hit as a vertex, so for sure. But now uh, it will be possible to exit. So possible exit. And uh, the remaining case is uh, having rather uh, negative values of alpha. And in this case, in fact, with probability one, we are going to never uh, hit uh, zero. So actually for me, it will not be that important to hit or not to hit a zero. I just wanted to illustrate uh, that if you know this parameter alpha, uh, it's possible to say something about the process, okay? So we did it with uh, hitting zero. And also I wanted to give a few examples of, of possible cases where we can feel that uh, uh, at least from a geometric point of view, something is happening. Okay, so I, I move on. Um, so now we have a process, um, hoping that uh, you have uh, understood a few things and so we, we're a bit comfortable with it. And the question is how to study this process. Of course, in probability, we, we can introduce many different uh, objects. And uh, so today I'm going to look at what we call a, a stationary distribution. Um, so to give a definition, in fact, I, I did it uh, right here. So it has a very uh, intuitive meaning. In fact, we're going to compute, uh, let's say, a pi of A, A is any domain, uh, included in my code. And by definition, it will be the average time spent in this domain between time zero and time infinity. So said a bit differently, it's uh, the formula I have written here. So we take one over T and then we, we measure the time spent between zero and T of the process in, in this domain A, okay? So we have uh, some, some, some number and so it's not always the case that it's possible to define a, such a stationary distribution, 
and uh, so I will not speak about this, but I will assume that we have one. And in fact, because we have a, a continuous process, uh, we might have that the pi admits a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And uh, so this is, this is the main topic and the main object I'm going to, to consider. So pi of u and v, so you have two variables, will be the density of uh, uh, pi of a, of my stationary distribution. So this has just uh, some intuitive mean. If one is given uh, some probabilistic uh, model, then the question is how to compute, how to have an access to a stationary distribution. And if you look at a very simple uh, object, uh, namely a, a Markov chain, a finite state uh, uh, Markov chain, how to compute the stationary distribution? Uh, we just have to solve an equation uh, which takes the form a pi, so this is my, my stationary distribution, and then I apply identity matrix uh, minus uh, some transition matrix P equals zero. So in other words, we're just solving a, a matrix equation and I'm looking for some eigenvalue uh, to, to, to this equation. So at least this is concrete. I mean, we know how to compute it. And uh, so for me now it's, uh, it's more complicated because I have continuous time, I have continuous uh, space. So for sure something that simple will, will not work. Uh, but still there is something similar, uh, which says that, so sometimes this is called uh, a, a generator of the process. And I have exactly the same in my setting. So I have G, which will be a generator. Somehow GP is equal to zero. So whatever it means, so sorry, I'm, I don't give a lot of details. I just wanted to say that finally it's very close to the a well-known setting of a discrete uh, Markov chains. We have a similar way if you want to compute uh, the stationary distribution. And so a bit more precisely, um, this is in fact exactly a PDE. So this is a partial differential equation. And uh, because of uh, these reflections, we have some oblique uh, Neumann conditions. So I think you can imagine that uh, we are solving a, a PDE and the reflection make uh, this uh, not very usual conditions to be uh, oblique and, and to Neumann. And another way to look, to look at the same equation, so again, a GP is equal to zero, um, is to take uh, now some Laplace transform, which I'm going to introduce uh, later, and to study some uh, functional equation. So a priori, we have the two, these two choices, which are equivalent. And um, yeah, I chose to, to use the second one in my talk. And now, um, two examples. So we have this uh, stationary distribution. We have uh, the density pi of u and v. And uh, I just wanted to give uh, the most famous example when alpha is equal to, to zero. So what is the simplest form that we, we could have for this uh, function pi? In fact, it is just uh, some exponential function. So here you, you can see, um, it, yeah, again, it's the simplest form you, you might hope uh, for this stationary distribution. I mean, it's just an exponential function. And um, so there is this nice theorem by uh, Mike Harrison. Um, and the theorem says that this is equivalent uh, to alpha uh, equals zero. So I, we like this result a lot because, uh, so first it, it uh, relates some probabilistic uh, thing. I mean, having an exponential distribution to a geometric information about alpha. So it's nice to have this uh, equivalence. And I'm so imagine that now if, if we know that we're able to compute uh, the stationary distribution, if you have in mind that we are doing some approximation uh, with discrete models, it means that again, we can use discrete models and compute a lot of things on these models. So all these uh, skew symmetric uh, cases uh, became very popular because of this and they were used in, in many examples. And uh, uh, later, uh, there was this uh, generalization by two colleagues uh, in uh, England at that time, Dika and, and Moriarty. And um, it's a nice generalization. So they said, finally, we can also have a sum 
of uh, similar exponential product forms, and uh, let's say a, for, uh, a sum of n plus one terms, if and uh, only if uh, alpha is equal to to minus n. So it's a negative integer. Yeah, so again, I have the same remark. It's a nice result because, uh, say, and it's exactly what I call exceptional parameters. It means that if alpha by chance is equal to a negative integer, then we can compute uh, everything, at least uh, from this uh, stationary distribution point of view. And if, if we look a bit at the proof of this result, it's related to, to tilings, finally, of the plane. So we have this uh, initial cone of AL beta. And what the Dicker and Moriarty do is that they, they just perform some uh, reflections of the cone with not, not uh, always the same angle. So it's not just a tiling by regular cones. It's a bit more complicated. But at the end, the result is related to, I mean, have it, having a, a real tiling of the, of the plane. So it's, again, it's also very geometric. And so, now I will move to the main results uh, uh, which we have obtained with some uh, collaborators. And this is, again, a generalization of uh, Dicker and Moriarty in the sense that now we want to compute um, more cases where it's possible to, to have simplifications. So not only simple sums of exponential product forms, but, and, and one of the questions is how to measure uh, the complexity of, uh, of a function. Yeah, so before to present the result, before presenting the result, I wanted just to introduce uh, the Laplace transform. So there is no difficulty here. Uh, instead of pi of u and v, so the density uh, of my stationary distribution, I will be looking at uh, its Laplace transform. So L, now I have two variables, x and y, and uh, just I integrate, uh, so like here, a pi against uh, this exponential function. So uh, as, you, uh, as you know, there is a equivalence finally between uh, knowing pi, so the density, or knowing L in the sense that if you know pi, we can try and, and compute L. And also we can use uh, like the reverse uh, Laplace transform to, to compute uh, uh, pi if we know L. So a priori, we don't lose any, uh, in, any information between the two representations. So if I come back to uh, the skew symmetry, what happens for the Laplace transform? So this is just an explicit computation. And um, so we can just integrate uh, everything explicitly because we have exponential functions. And after some easy computations, we have like mu one over mu one plus x uh, times uh, mu two over mu two plus y. So the exact result is not important to me. Uh, what is important is, is to say that L is a rational function. So if you look at the dependency um, of L in terms of x and y, we have uh, just a rational dependency, right? And so for sure, I mean, just by linearity of the Laplace transform, we have exactly the same results in the case of Dicker and Moriarty. We know that L, whatever it is, we know that it has to be a, a rational function of X and Y. Yeah, so for me, it would be a bit better to look at this um, uh, property uh, than looking at this uh, exponential uh, product from uh, property. And now I, I am ready to state uh, the main result. So it has been obtained in collaboration with some colleagues, uh, Mireille Buskemelou, uh, Andrew L. V. Price, Sandro Franceschi, and, and Charlotte Ardo. So th this is a long list of, of people, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but else I wanted to say that, uh, so for example, Charlotte Ardo is working in, uh, just in, in pure mathematics, and Mireille Buskemelou is known, uh, is well known for many works in combinatorics. So, I mean, it was a, a mix between different people, and we try to to give to have different insights uh, on, on the same problem. So it was at least for me it was a nice collaboration. And so we wanted to to give, as I said before, a generalization of a Dicker and Moriarty results, but looking at this Laplace transform, and we wanted to measure the complexity, if 
and if it's not very precise now, of uh, this Laplace transform uh, L. And uh, we did it using so some classes of functions, which I'm going to introduce uh, now. Um, so the M is the following. If you give me some analytic function, or some power series, uh, we have just a kind of uh, a union of different classes of functions. And we, we can try to put uh, this analytic function in one of these classes. So let me be a bit more precise. So we have seen already uh, what was a, a rational function. So by definition, uh, let's say in one variable, f of x is rational if it is a ratio of two polynomials. So this is classic. Um, then we have a slightly bigger class uh, given by algebraic uh, functions. And again, I mean, I'm sure we all know what it is. So by definition, f is alg algebraic if we have a relation uh, like this, a polynomial relation. Of course, uh, p needs to be done. Um, and so again, we, we increase a bit uh, the class of functions. And now I'm looking at a definite, so this for a different shape, um, definite functions. The definition is that f uh, has to satisfy a linear differential equation. So for example, of order two, we have something like this. But a priori, there is, I mean, there is no assumption on, on the order. It may be of any order. So this is a definite function. Um, this is just an exercise to prove that if we have an algebraic function, in fact, it also has to satisfy a, a linear differential equation, just because we can play a bit around with this polynomial p uh, in the algebraic function and, and uh, obtain a differential equation. So this is a really a, a hierarchy uh, uh, in the classes of function. And the biggest class, I mean, on this uh, left uh, part, is a class of d-algebraic uh, functions. So now, by definition, it's a set of all functions which satisfy some uh, differential equation, which might be a uh, nonlinear. So, you know, if, if we have a term uh, of the form, I don't know, f prime uh, squared, this is uh, no longer linear. And so this is not a definite function if we have a, an equation like this. So again, I put some, some cube here. So it's nonlinear. It's not a definite function a priori, but it's called d algebraic. So here I'm writing uh, the differential equation for the, the p Weierstrass function. But anyway, I mean, this is a, some differential equation. And so we have all these uh, nice functions on the left, and then we have all the other ones, uh, which by definition uh, are called, uh, called hypertransformable. So here it means that all these functions in the, in the red part do not satisfy any a differential equation. So there is no differential equation for all these functions. So maybe the, the, the most famous example of a hypertranscendental function is the gamma function of uh, Euler. Um, and there is a, a theorem by uh, Holder uh, who proved that uh, uh, gamma cannot satisfy any. Uh, differential equation, linear or nonlinear. And maybe you, you know by heart a, a proof of these results. In fact, most of the proofs, there are, there are plenty of proofs, but most of them uh, use uh, this equation, which we know uh, on the gamma function. So this is typically a functional equation on some function, on the function gamma. And if you look at many proofs of, uh, uh, hypertranscendental results. In fact, it's very often the case that we start uh, by some equation. And so imagine that uh, we assume, even if, if we know that it's not true, but we assume that we had a differential equation for gamma. Um, then we can just put uh, this relation uh, gamma of x plus one is equal to x gamma of x in uh, this differential equation. And then we can construct a new uh, differential equation, let's say with uh, smaller order. So it's easy to obtain some contradictions in, in, in the reasonings and prove that it's not possible to have any uh, differential equation. So there is also the zeta function of Riemann. And uh, in fact, 
uh, basically all functions are almost all functions are hyper transformable. If you take uh, so even it's possible to give a sense to, to this uh, statement with probability one, if you take a, a random function, it will be hyper transformable. Of course, this needs to be uh, uh, more precise. Okay, so uh, to summarize, we have all these classes of functions and we want to put uh, our Laplace transform L into any of these classes. So it's a way for us to measure how complex uh, our model is. So, and it's not unrelated from probability um, because imagine that uh, we have a, a power theory. So let's say F of X is a power theory. And imagine that we know that it is definite. So it satisfies a linear differential equation. In fact, this is equivalent uh, for the coefficients. So now I'm looking at the Fi, so the coefficients. Uh, to satisfy to satisfy sorry uh, a linear recurrence and so i think this, this is the reason why a combinatorialist like a definite functions because uh, if we have a linear recurrence for the coefficients it means we can compute them very efficiently we can say something about the asymptotics and so on so this is a nice way to describe uh, uh, functions or sequences to prove the definiteness of properties. And the improbability, uh, imagine that's F and it's what happens for uh, Laplace transform. Uh, then the Fi are related to the moments of the, of the model. And so it's also a way to compute a very probabilistic estimates uh, of the moment. So I mean, just to say that it's not just to, to be able to classify uh, this model, but this has some uh, implication in, in probability. And yet, so, so to summarize, we, we have done, a, we have obtained this uh, table. So for each of the classes I have just uh, detailed, we were able to give uh, necessary and sufficient conditions in terms of the parameters. Um, so if I recall the Dicker and Moriarty uh, uh, results, What they had um, is that they, ha they had a rational uh, Laplace transforms. And in fact, it's equivalent uh, for alpha to be a negative integer. So this is really equivalent. And so I, I don't want to, to present all the equivalences because it will be a bit of redundant, but just have in mind that for each category, we have a necessary and sufficient condition. And let me just describe uh, the very last one, so for hyper transcendental case, cases. Um, so we proved that this is equivalent uh, to two conditions. The first one is that pi uh, over beta uh, should, should not be a, a rational number. And uh, alpha uh, should not be in this uh, subgroup of R. Yeah. So this is a bit technical, but finally, uh, I wanted to emphasize that we have uh, arithmetic conditions. Everything is in terms of beta, of alpha, uh, and so on. And so a priori, uh, if one is given so, some beta and some alpha, it's possible to check um, that pi over beta is not so rational. I mean, even in practice, it could be very difficult because it's an arithmetic question. But still, in examples, we, we can check if it is uh, the case or not. And um, so maybe this condition, the first one, is um, easily understandable, I would say, because imagine that pi over beta, on the contrary, what happens if pi over beta is a rational number? So what happens if we have this? To give a, a simple example, it's, it's the case for the quarter plane, right? So we have beta is equal to pi over 2. And in this case, uh, this is equal to 2. And again, this, this is related to some tilings because if we have a pi over beta rational, we can do a tiling. So either of the plane or of some cover of the plane, but in any case, we can do some tiling. And um, so there is this uh, reflection principle in probability, which says, or at least suggests 
uh, that if we're able to have a tiling, it will not be possible for the process to, to behave uh, widely, I, I would say. And so this is why if we want to have a, a hyper transcendental function, so a very complex uh, Laplace transform, uh, we should avoid to be in, in this nice situation of having a, a tilings of the, the plane. Okay. And uh, so now I wanted to give a few uh, ideas about the, the proof. So how, how we did obtain this, this result. So the first one is we need to, to state a function, uh, sorry, an equation, a functional equation on the Laplace transform. So this is a very important uh, equation. And in fact, I, I could do just a, one talk on on such equations because, um, yeah, I think there are many, many things related to, to this. Uh, so before explaining a bit the proof, let, let me just comment a bit on this equation. So there is just one unknown, uh, which is L. What is a bit surprising is that's uh, finally just one unknown, but it appears at uh, three different places and every time with di the different evaluations. So the first uh, part is X and Y. And on the right, you can see x uh, zero and then uh, zero y. Um, so this is for the unknown part. So at this step, we, we have no idea what is L and the, the goal is to find L. And um, I can also say something about the coefficients uh, in this equation. So the first one is, uh, is gamma. And so I, I will define it later. And then we also have two reflections say two one order polynomials who just correspond to the reflection. Uh, so let's say that this part on the right uh, finally corresponds to the boundary axis and uh, the part of, on the left of, of my equation corresponds to the inner, the interior of my domain. So now le le let me define gamma. Let's say first on some examples, just to show, show you that uh, gamma finally it's very simple. If we take, um, uh, a non-correlated uh, Brownian motion, it will be just one half and then x squared uh, plus y squared. And imagine that the drift is just, I know, minus one, minus one, some symmetric drift. Then I, I'm going to have minus x minus y. So this is a very simple object, right? A, a very simple uh, degree two uh, polynomial in x and y. And in general, if, if we take um, a general Brunel motion, uh, we just have to add uh, here uh, some coefficient with a mix a term like x, y, let's say plus uh, some uh, a correlation coefficient r, x, y. And then there is this question. So how to solve, how to say something about uh, such equations? So people started to be interested in these equations in the, in the 70s and um, more in the discrete setting, actually. And so now we, we know a lot of things uh, about this. And what is nice for us is that we have a very simple uh, a kernel. So it's, it's what, what we call the kernel of the, of the equation, this uh, function gamma. Imagine that if you, you look at similar equations for discrete models, then gamma could be a polynomial of any order, just related to how big uh, we have uh, jumps. And uh, in this case, uh, th this would be much more complicated. Now we just have a second order polynomial in X and Y, and so it, it makes everything uh, simple. And uh, in particular, um, now if you want to, to describe uh, what is uh, the zero set, what is gamma equals zero? So we just want to describe this. This is a Riemann surface. And uh, because uh, the degree of the polynomial, in fact, it's a Riemann surface of genus uh, zero. So we are in the simplest situation. And uh, there is a, a famous theorem that we can uh, uniformize or parameterize any uh, uh, genus zero Riemann surface in terms of rational functions. So without giving uh, the details, we know that it's possible to describe uh, the set of X and Y uh, such that gamma is equal to zero as an explicit uh, solution. And uh, so we, we can write everything explicitly. So I will not give a formulas uh, in terms of, uh, of the, this S variable. 
So here, I mean, it, it's not complicated. So it's exactly the same if we had, uh, let's say, uh, the, the unit circle. And we just want to give a parametrization. Of it. So for example, we can say, OK, this will be equal to uh, cos uh, s and then sine s. So this is just what I call a parametrization. And uh, yeah, again, so in my case, we have this totally explicitly, and so we can go further in the computations. And um, just checking the time, so I'm almost done. Yeah, the only thing, I, probably the last thing to understand, so before stating the, the final equation, is that we have some uh, invariance of this function uh, x and uh, yeah, x and y. So finally, I'm happy to have introduced this uh, circle on the right because here also we have some invariance, right? I mean, uh, for example, cos of minus s is equal to cos of s. And uh, this is related to the fact that, of course, if you change here x uh, into, a, yeah, I mean, I know how, how exactly Related to it, but at least we can also see some uh, um, invariance on this equation, and this transfers into some invariance uh, at the level of this s variable. Okay, uh, and we have exactly the same here. We have two invariance properties uh, from a uniformization. Um, so one of of them is something like this. So we have a nice invariance, and so for the first time, now we see. A, a parameter Q, oh, sorry, uh, apparent. Because we have something like Y this time of Q uh, over S is equal to Y of S. So we have some explicit rational functions, so X and Y, and you can check that we have uh, this kind of uh, invariance properties. And Q, uh, in fact, it's, uh, so it's a complex parameter as in all Q difference equations, and it's uh, exponential of uh, a two i a beta. So beta is just the opening of the group. So again, this has some uh, geometric interpretation. And finally, so, and I will conclude by this. So if, if let's say in this, uh, in this nice equation here, you say, now I, I just work on uh, this Riemann surface. So I put x is equal to x of s, y is equal to uh, y of s. Doing so, we have this, which is equal to zero. So everything, let's say, on the left will be equal to zero. And so we have a relation between the, the, all the terms on the right uh, side of the equation. And finally, we have uh, this uh, equation uh, on, on the Laplace transform, which is exactly, and in fact, even uh, simpler, exactly an example of a Q difference equation, I mean, on my very first slide. I said uh, simpler because, uh, in fact, a priori, uh, I could even allow uh, some non-homogeneous term like this, but it happens that it doesn't appear here. And um, the function a is related to to my reflections. I mean, which is natural because, of course, for sure, the reflection uh, have to act uh, on the problem. And uh, finally, so the the main result where we were able to classify all the, the complexity of the generating functions, the Laplace transform, um, was obtained just by uh, studying uh, this kind of equations in the world of uh, Q-difference equations and, and Galois theory and, and so on. Yeah, so thank you very much for your attention and, and I'm, I'm happy to have questions if, if you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Killian, for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, I, I have a question. I hope my um, signal is strong enough for you to hear me. Uh, uh, that was a beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, it, 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 it seemed that. Um, the drift parameter plays almost no role in uh, in any of this. I was just curious if you could comment on that. 
Yeah, yeah, you, so you are totally right. Um, so find it just a bit because you know if, if at the moment where I wanted to define the stationary distribution, um, then in fact uh, it it plays a role, but a bit uh, transparent, but it plays a role uh, because imagine that we have uh, some drift in, in this direction, then in fact the process will not admit some stationary measure, and so everything what what I said uh, just uh, doesn't exist. But you are right that in fact in all my uh, uh, these conditions, the drift uh, just doesn't occur. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, which is a bit surprising, I agree, but it, I mean, it's uh, it's how it is. <laughs> I mean, often drift with Brownian motion or with pro um, stochastic processes has a fairly simple effect on the Laplace transform. So I guess in terms of um, the um, transcendentality with these sorts of conditions, it, it, it makes a little bit of sense to me that it doesn't appear. Um, the other question I had was about, um, uh, so beta here should be um, less than pi over two or something, or this applies even to oblique, um, to obtuse angles, or are there any conditions on beta? Yeah, so this is a good question. So uh, I think we have uniform proofs uh, if beta uh, is between zero and pi, in fact. And, uh, and then we had some questions about uh, the other case of having non-convex cones. So if now we take a, a beta a bigger than pi, and in fact, we could even take beta to be arbitrarily big and then working on some covers of the plane. I mean, it's also some option. And um, yeah, to be honest, for a long time, I, I didn't know if we had any uh, phase transition at, at pi. Uh, but it, in fact, it seems, and uh, so it's, it's also why we're working with Andrew LV Price, because he has a nice contributions on some uh, the quantity of works uh, with winding numbers. And we can use similar arguments and finally, uh, all these cases will be almost similar. So there is no deep difference between the two settings. Even if I guess the, the limiting case uh, is interesting. Uh, and also in relate, and so if you look at these Q difference equations, in fact, it's what, what we call confluence of uh, Q difference equations. And we have uh, some differential uh, equations at the limit. So it's a nice case, but finally, which is almost the same as, as the other. But yeah, I mean, at least for us, it was a very interesting question for a long time. Okay. Thank you very much. I have a question too. Yeah, sure. Sorry, there was one uh, question not contained with uh, probability. You start uh, your talk, uh, use uh, some equation uh, for theta on the first page, on the first, yeah. first slide, yes. On first slide, yes, how it is possible theta of QS is equal QS multiply theta of S. So, so if you take theta of QS and divide by QS, it doesn't depend on Q. Theta is theta Q? No, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. I mean, yeah, for sure. The theta is theta Q. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, so. This is not a divide. Person guaranteed, but, right? Uh, uh, no. Yeah, so I, I mean, for sure, it, it could be the case that I did a small error. You divide. Mm -hmm. If it is not true, it, it should be very I mean, almost true. But this example, another thing we, we could say on it is that, uh, I mean, how, how it fits in this uh, nice uh, Ishizaki uh, theorem. Because a priori, uh, um, so we need this hypothesis of having a, a meromorphic function on C. And for sure, this theta S function is not because it has a pole at zero of infinite order. So I mean- No, no, I say just about this equation. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. QS. If, you, if you insert QS instead of S, uh, okay, but uh, you have a- um, QS multiply theta Q. Yeah. I think it should oh, yes. be. Yes, oh, just, oh, maybe, maybe, uh -huh, maybe. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's yeah. another question from Dimitri. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so you mentioned that when your alpha is zero or negative integer, you have a meromorphic function. What do you know about the analytic behavior of your function for other values of alpha? What, what kind of singularities does it have? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, 
So we are always in this situation um, that we are able, so, so let's say I'm just working with uh, one variable. So I don't consider L of X and Y, but just L of X and zero. I mean, to have a, a usual uh, one variable complex uh, function. And uh, we are always in this situation that we have uh, so the plane and uh, we can, so it's obvious that we have convergence in this domain because we have a Laplace transform and uh, we have a singularity at a possible singularity here, which is a, of an algebraic type. And then we have to take a, a cut, I mean, like we, we could do for the square root function in this domain. So between this point and infinity, and maybe we ha have also some pool here. And um, so in the rational case, in fact, uh, this cut here just uh, doesn't appear, but it, a priori it's possible to have it. And indeed in general, it, it, will, be, uh, it will be here. So finally, we are, uh, uh, we are analytic, we are mer meromorphic on some cut plane. So on C uh, cut along some uh, infinite yeah. interval. Okay, that's interesting, okay. Uh, I come from analytic number theory and this kind of um, analytic continuations appear a lot in, uh, for the, not for the Riemann zeta function, but when you take uh, irrational or rational powers of the Riemann zeta function. Mm -hmm. uh, which is also the Laplace transform or something. So yeah, yeah. There's an analogy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any further questions? I think we have two questions in the chat. I, I'd like ah, to sorry, excuse me. Speaker. No, no problem. So the first question is, how do you motivate the use of stir, Sturmian sequences? Um, so what do you mean exactly by this? Because Indeed, in, in our paper, we, at some point, we have something related to this, but uh, I would be happy if uh, we could develop a bit. Yeah, if the, if the person, if Orson would like to clarify, please unmute yourself. Um, if Orson, Orson, would you like to clarify? Uh, well, they also have another question. Which yeah, is, yeah. Uh, uh, is the Laplace transform always in agreement with the Galois criteria of differential transcendence? Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I can comment a bit on this point. So for, we, we used uh, uh, some result from a differential Galois theory. And uh, so exactly on, on, on this kind, I mean, even if here we have some difficulty because a priori, uh, as I was mentioning just before, we have some problem with this cut plane. So we are not globally meromorphic, but we, we have meromorph we are meromorphic just on some cut plane. But if you just do another kind of transformation, we can have a globally meromorphic portion and then we can apply some uh, uh, more usual uh, Galois criteria for uh, differential transcendence, for example. And then, so typically, what is nice with this uh, result is that a priori we want to say something on F, which is a unknown function. And this uh, Galois criteria, say that everything happens on, uh, on A, so on the known part. And because A uh, is, was related, as I was mentioning to this uh, uh, reflections, then we can work with some, something very concrete. So the so abstract question uh, became very concrete and we just have to check uh, whether A uh, satisfies a kind of uh, a different equation of a certain type. And, and this can be done just by looking at the poles and, and, and so on. And so this is how I understood also the first question because now if you want to say something about the poles of, uh, of A, we have a kind of uh, storm and sequences for which, I mean, we had some questions about the conciliations and the periodicity, but I'm not sure that it was how it was meant uh, here. But thank you in any case for the question. Uh, I'd also like to ask a question. Um, yeah, sure. So I, I, it seems that the techniques that you used, all these results are only true for these planar examples. So when you're in two dimensions, essentially. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in terms of a reflected Brownian motion, a cone, you can imagine that like you could create a higher dimensional version of this. I'm just curious whether or not you mentioned there was um, 
also this PDE approach in studying these oblique derivative conditions and whether or not those models could generalize these results to higher dimensions more easily. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is a good question. And for all this community, um, I mean, we're working hard to have some results because I guess it's really, really a good result if we're able to say something in higher dimension. Um, so, yeah, for sure, this approach cannot work in higher dimension because we use complex analysis. We use yeah, the fact of having two variables. And if you look at the same functional equation in higher dimension, we have so many terms that it's just impossible to work with, with it. So we, we have the same problem with discrete models where we, we have to abandon a bit uh, all these approaches to, to make it work. So yeah, for, for the PD, I mean, at least it, it's one approach. But I have no idea. I mean, um, um, yeah. At least this Q-symmetry condition works for in any dimension. So this is the result which we can obtain for, for any dimension. We know that there is some model uh, with a very simple uh, exponential uh, distribution. But even the analog of a Dicker and Moriarty result, let's say just a sum of two exponential terms. So nobody knows an example, even in dimension three, which uh, admits such a distribution. So I mean, I, I don't know if uh, this PD could help. Uh, and maybe it's it's an option. So we should consider it a bit more seriously. I, I don't know. Sorry. And how the theorem you uh, formulate uh, in the first uh, slide? How it is connected with the uh, result? Uh, how? Uh, you mean this, this uh, Ishizaki theorem? First, first one, first one. I don't know. First, yes, how this is uh, connected with the, your result? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so this is connected because finally, the, so the very last equation, uh, which has the form um, of, so we have this Laplace transform and we have exactly an equation of this form. Mm -hmm. And so finally, we, we can say, a priori, um, if it was possible to apply these results uh, without any difficulty, we could say uh, either f is rational or, or f is hypertransformative. Mm. But the problem is that um, exactly, I mean, this is this problem that we don't have a meromorphic function. And so because of this, instead of just two categories of function, I mean, rational and hypertransformative, we're able to see much more and uh, algebraic functions, definite functions, and so on. So this comes from some uh, default of uh, regularity for the function f. But a priori, this is uh, directly related because, uh, yeah, we have uh, such a, a Q-difference equation for the Laplace transform, and so we, yeah. But I used the shortcut uh, in the presentation. You are right. The hypertranscendental, uh, it it means that it uh, have some uh, sufficient uh, so, so, Essential singularity, uh, or, or how? It's, uh, I mean, it, it may be, but in fact, already in the in the class of uh, differentially algebraic functions, I mean, where we could have a, we have a differential equation, you might have a, a, this kind of singularities. So yeah, this is a bit a problem of this class of functions. This picture, what what this what this picture means with singul with singularity? Yes, what does it mean? Um, I mean, so this is a, I can easily answer for, for the, no, the no, first no, class. Next, 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 the next, next is page. I, I cannot answer. I mean, it's not possible to study in general, uh, differentially algebraic functions in terms of singularity. It's too complicated. Uh, I mean, everything can happen. For, for example, uh, I like this theorem. So a kind of a universality uh, theorem, I would say that there exists uh, a differentially algebraic function, just one, I mean, which is universal, and uh, with which you can approximate any uh, continuous function on any domain. So a kind of function which you can use to approximate with some uh, suitable uh, initial conditions, any uh, continuous function that uh, there exists in the, in the world. So, I mean, this is a class of function which is quite uh, wild and uh, we can say nothing in general about the singularities, unfortunately. Yes, you, 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 in, in your comment to the first theorem, you, 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 you write something about singularities, uh, Paul, uh, what does it, uh, how it is connected yeah. with the, uh, ah, yeah, sorry. the, the first, first and second pages, yeah, how yeah. the singularities I mean, uh, connected with your 
arguments anyhow. Okay. First, okay. I, I can clarify. Page. Page. Yeah, yeah, but I think the argument is also here. So what happens that you are right, we cannot conclude to this uh, hyper transcendence if we just look at the poles of F. So this is, uh, but what this uh, Galois uh, result says is that now if, if you do the same for A, and A is a coefficient which appears in the equation, now this becomes possible. And we have a criterion on A in terms of singularities to say we are in this situation of a hyper transcendence or in this situation of uh, rationality. So this is possible for A, but not for F directly. So you are right. And but, I mean, this is the goal of Galois theory to, to be able to say something on the nature of the functions uh, without looking at the function itself, but at a kind of uh, other equa uh, equations that it satisfies. So this is very useful in this case. But A and B are rational function or what function are A, B? Exactly, yeah, they are totally rational and even very, very simple because for us, it was a polynomial of degree two uh, divided by a polynomial of degree two. I mean, it, it is a very simple function, but already uh, with such a simple function, you might have at the end uh, a transcendental uh, uh, solution F. Mm -hmm. So can you show once more the uh, first and second slide of your lecture, yeah. Yeah. I don't understand what your, what was your argument about singularity. Yes, this this picture with uh, with with Paul and uh, something else. Uh, a bit below. Yes, this one. Yes, what does uh, it no, mean? I, I mean well, no, this was just to, to say that um, L of x and, and zero. So so now you see, uh, I'm not working at the same level. So I just use the x variable, and uh, in all my uh, uh, Ishizaki result and Q difference equations, I use this uh, uniformization. So I'm working on two different complex planes, mm. and sometimes it's better to, to work in this or in, in this other. And for this picture about the regularity of the function, this is what happens just for uh, L of X and zero. So we just mm -hmm. uh, has one singularity. But I mean, it's also possible to have a function which is hyper transcendental and, and which has uh, no singularity, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Great, so if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank Killian one more time for a really beautiful talk. Thank you.